Hey folks, welcome to episode six of Father Offspring Interviews. Um, before we jump into questions, I just want to take a moment to say happy birthday to both my wonderful father and mother uh, who just had theirs this past weekend. So, yay! <laughs> We're Technology. living in the future. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, we're going to start today with a question from Ellen from Missouri, who asks, uh, does jealousy have value in driving humans to improve themselves, or is it a purely negative emotion? Um, interestingly, that's a question I've kind of been thinking a lot about. Um, yes, I think it does have positive values. Uh, both in terms of people improving themselves, motivating them competitively, all of that. And the question is, could we live without it? Um, which takes us to this whole issue of, okay, there's no free will. You can't praise or reward anyone. That makes no sense whatsoever. You've got to get rid of meritocracies. And, but there's a problem with that which is just as like if you get rid of the whole criminal justice system because blame and punishment make no sense, nonetheless, you got to protect people from dangerous people. If you get rid of meritocracies and praise and reward, or nonetheless, like you don't want somebody picked at random to like examine your brain tumor kind of thing. Um, so the question is, in an absence of convincing somebody that they are vastly entitled to a better salary and a better place in life and a better sense of wealth or self-worth um, just because they've become very skillful at something important. How do you get people to put in the often years and years of work to become skillful at something very difficult and important? And I'm struggling with that one. And of course, you know, the, the, dirty underside of motivation is, ooh, I'm going to catch them and be better than them. I'm going to, I'm going to show them up. I'm going to, I'm going to gain my vengeance on all those kids who were mean to me in middle school, all those versions of things motivating us for reasons that may not be the best. It's part of this bar larger problem. I don't know very well at this point how you're supposed to get rid of the sense of meritocracy when recognizing opportunities are not equally distributed and then recognizing that we do very enabling and titling things to people who are privileged enough to wind up being very good at something helpful. Um, so jealousy, that's part of all the things that are not going to be able to do it. And getting people to behave for the common good is going to get you only so far. Um, being filled with gratitude at how you turned out to be through no doings of your own can get you only so far also. Yeah, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about that one these days. All right, our next question from Brandon from Oregon is, what do you think about Ramachandran's theories that neural cross-wiring between neighboring regions of the brain can explain things like synesthesia and other interesting phenomena? Oh, Ramachandran, UC San Diego, fabulous scientist, incredibly creative guy, uh, doing all sorts of interesting work on phantom limbs and phantom penises, but that's a whole other story. But in this case, synesthesia, synesthesia, when you are intermixing your different sensory modalities. Somebody makes a sound and you see it. Somebody says something and you smell it or of intermixing like that, which seems totally crazy, except we like do that all the time. We have crosstalk between our sensory systems all the time. All these classic studies, you sit somebody down and they're like trying some new potato chip and they're rating how good they think it is. And if you have crackling sounds in the background, people think it tastes better. Somehow the sound and the taste are intermixing. Or oh, this, this is a great example that Ramachandran shows it here. Okay, so you show somebody like pictures of two figures and then you like give them two made up words. Uh, Lugish. 
Lukish or Krakaraka. Okay, so you've got two made-up words, splugish or cracker-actor, and you ask people which goes to which, and people are way, way disproportionately likely to make the soft-sounding splugish go with the soft, contoured lines of that, whereas, what did I say, cracker-actor, we'll go to this one. You're having crosstalk between sound and processing the visual stuff. So we all do that. There are people who do absolutely amazing versions of this people with like major league synesthesia. There was this Russian neuropsychologist, Luria, who wrote a whole book, The Mind of the Mnemonist, about this guy who had probably one of the strongest cases of synesthesia ever. You make a sound and he felt it and he saw it and he smelled it and tasted it. And each of these was just mixing over. And what did this guy do for a living? He was a memory performer. He would appear before audiences where they would say, oh, well, you know, 23 years ago, you appeared on this stage in Vladivostok, and we gave you a page of 30, 20-digit numbers long, and which you, have, you happen to remember them, and out they come because he remembered everything, because every bit of sensory information came with not just looking at the numbers, but a sound and a taste and a smell and a sense, and everything was so rich that he remembered everything and he couldn't forget anything. And then you get like people, number, color, synesthesia, people who associate different numbers with different colors. And when you get people who really get going with that, um, your brother back when had some elements of color number synesthesia. When you get the really big time people, they could do math in the colors. You have this color plus that color equals, and they're processing it as fast as the numbers. So what's going on with that in the brain? And what Ramachandran thinks, speculates, is there's some sort of crosstalk somewhere, you know, stuff going from your eyes is going one place and for years someplace else, but there's a part of the brain called the thalamus where stuff sort of intersects. As we said, the thalamus is the sensory, sensory way station. Um, so there may be crosstalk there, or there may be crosstalk at the level of like neurons in your visual cortex that shouldn't be talking to neurons in your auditory cortex or doing that. It's got to be something like that. Um, next, uh, Matt from California asks, uh, do you draw any distinctions between the word determined and predetermined? Um, I've only ever heard you use the former, but you don't correct people who use the latter. So I'm curious. Well, I don't correct them because I'm trying to be a good house guest. Um, there's a big difference between the two. And Matt, you are correct. I only use determine. Determined in the sense that there's no free will, all of that. Predetermined, once you get rid of its theological implications, which I do not want to go near with a 10-foot pole, once you get rid of that, predetermined is kind of the sense that because of the rules of the physical universe, like two and a half minutes after the Big Bang, all of the future was already set. All of it was predetermined. And that's not remotely the case. At any given point right now in the present, there are multiple possible futures because of chaoticism, because of nonlinearities, all of that. At any given point, the future is not already determined. It's only once whatever particular version of the future that happens happens that you could see where the determinism was. Why is this a big distinction? Because one of the ways in which people like go off the rails with, oh my God, if you're saying there's no free will, you're saying nothing can ever change. It's completely predetermined. That's not in the slightest. We change. We change dramatically. The key thing though is we do not choose to change freely exercising will we are changed as a function of who we are in any given moment and what we're experiencing. So big difference between a deterministic world, which we live in, and a predeterministic one, which we don't. It's a great question. Um, okay, so we've, we've been seeing a fair number of questions about drugs, particularly psychedelics. Um, so among others, uh, Pim from the Netherlands asks, have you ever smoked weed and or tried psychedelics, regardless of the answer? What is your view on these ancient medicines? Um, and Sharif from Atlanta slash Pakistan asks, um, 
psychedelics are gaining a lot of public attention as viable treatments for mental health disorders. What are your thoughts regarding this? Well, I hope people watching this realizes the, the bizarrity right now of somebody's daughter questioning him about his drug use, but we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Um, in terms of this larger issue, use of various psychedelics these days for certain types of depression, some progress with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, absolutely the case, absolutely promising. Two dogs are now heard from. Absolutely promising, um, which makes perfect yet another class of medications that do interesting things to neurochemistry. Um, fortunately, the work that's being done is being very tightly regulated and well supervised and all of that. But it's very exciting stuff suggesting that these might be very therapeutic for things like PTSD. In terms of my own personal whatevers, you know, as ahem. as you know, ahem, as you know, your your mother and I look like walking cliches of the uh, like neo wannabe sixties, and we inundated you with Pete Seeger and all of that. And despite that, neither of us have ever tried a drug. Your your mother drank a little bit back when in college, and then stopped. I have never had a sip of alcohol in my life. And um, I don't know why, other than when I was an adolescent, when all of my peers were starting to do all that stuff, it just struck me as asinine. So I decided I would have nothing to do with it. And here I am still sticking to that. So perhaps for interested listeners, um, nonetheless, my my wife and I, your mother, we have had only limited success with you and your brother in terms of that viewpoint. Next question. What's the next question? Hey, you're right. You know what? The drug of Catan has taken over. Um. <laughs> uh, settlers of Catan. That was the oh, drug yes. we raised you with. Okay. For our final question, um, Rafael from Brazil says, um, as an 80s kid with no cable TV and just a couple of National Geographic VHSs, I loved going to the zoo, seeing the animals in person. But now, though still fascinated, I feel kind of bad seeing those creatures in captivity. What do you think about zoos, pros and cons? I think in an extremely confused way about this and everything related to that. Um, I think perhaps reflecting... You know, I've kind of had two careers and one I've hung out with wild baboons and I think maybe now and then I did something that might have been helpful for them in terms of conservation, but where uh, these were animals I loved dearly. And then part of each year I was running a neurobiology lab um, and often doing some pretty brutal stuff to lab rodents in the name of trying to find some cures to neurological diseases. And I have spent forever being pulled back and forth between the two. Every now and then I've been attacked by animal rights groups. Every now and then I've worked with them to try to put like circus primate road shows out of business or to shut down labs that are doing appalling stuff to their primates. Um, oh, I don't know. It's very, I grew up in zoos. I love zoos. Uh, they're absolutely not okay in the broadest possible sense, but like a hell of a lot of people turned out to be zoologists or conservationists based on growing up in zoos and saying, ooh, you should only be able to see animals in the wild is incredibly classist and privileged and snooty. And maybe just the way to come to it is like places like the San Diego Zoo that are actually doing important conservation work for endangered species, zoos that have sufficient space, sufficient naturalistic settings for animals that they're not going out of their minds. Maybe that's the compromise, but I'm terribly conflicted about it. I don't know a clear answer. Yep. And that wraps up episode six. Um, submit questions at the forum found in the Instagram story highlight and bio or the YouTube video description. I'm Offspring Share Sapolsky, and thanks for your continued support of science and the beard. 
And don't forget, brushing your teeth doesn't count if you haven't flossed.